All right, so, um, yeah, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to give this talk. Um, this is random pulse sequences for Cuban noise spectroscopy. So I'll give the first part of the talk, and then I'll hand it over to Kaisin, who will give the second. And I should mention our collaborators, Dimitri Forfernik, Elena Veza Saif, and Mohamed Hafezi. So to introduce this, let me say a word about RC1. So RC1 is about verification of quantum simulators. And as Ken mentioned this morning, it's hard. Now, the way to approach a hard problem is to try to break it down into easier ones, and then they become less hard and more interesting. And so, that, and so that's the perspective behind this work, that, that we try to find an interesting aspect of characterizing quantum devices. And I'll tell you what that is and where we hope to go with it. So, so this is about noise spectroscopy, which is, which is a well-known technique for measurement and characterization of non-Markovian noise. Non-Markovian noise is noise that has time correlations. And so this means that the environment somehow has a memory, that it remembers things that happened to it in the past. Non-Markovian noise has a long history. It was first, so I don't know exactly where it began, but it had a long, it had a big impact in the development of classical electronics. Class ele classical electronics suffer from non-Markovian noise, such as one over F noise or colored noise. And this is well known. And and so there's been a lot of attention towards understanding it and understanding how to mitigate it. So one, one way of approaching this is to, is to study something called the noise spectral density, S of omega. So this is a function that, that depends on frequency omega. And somehow it characterizes the strength of the noise at a given frequency. So you can think of this as the Fourier transform of the time correlation function. So, th so this shows up in, in classical environments, and when you start to study quantum baths, it can become even more interesting, because now it's possible not just for the quantum bath to have a memory, but for it to have coherence. And so it can actually, it, and it can actually have uniquely quantum effects in addition to the things that you could see with classical non-Markovian noise. And so this, shows, this has been used in, in a variety of ways in experiments to study things like lexometry and to do procedures like dynamical decoupling. So now in the context of quantum simulation, non-Markovian noise appears in two different ways because in, in a quantum simulation, there are two quantum systems of interest. There's the system that you want to study and there's the simulator that tries to simulate it. And noise can appear in both of these. So on the one hand, there could be the system that you want to study which in many cases could be an open quantum system. For instance, if you want to study quantum phenomena that occur in atoms or molecules at room temperature. And so non-noise spectroscopy is a way of understanding this, this environment that is coupled to the quantum system. Now, if you look at the quantum simulator, noise plays a different role, that quantum simulators typically have noise and decoherence, and we need to do error mitigation and error correction on them. And so again, you care about doing noise spectroscopy because you need to model this noise in order to know how to mitigate it. And so here, here we might be trying to do noise spectroscopy on a superconducting qubit or a quantum dot. Okay. So, you know, so, so noise spectroscopy is, is challenging um, because we're now working with some very large and complex quantum systems. So these are sometimes called NISC systems for noisy intermediate scale quantum systems. And there are two real challenges that, or two distinct challenges that, are, that arise here. So, so one of them is simply the presence of noise, and the second one is the number of qubits involved. And so noise spectroscopy can be expensive and resource intensive for two reasons. So one of them is that we need to measure this noise spectral density, S of omega, at many different frequencies omega. Typically, we want to span multiple octaves of the frequency domain. and so. Typically, the way this is done is you use a pulse sequence that measures S of omega at a given omega, and then you change the pulse sequence for a different omega, and you sweep across this frequency domain. And this, in, and this inherently is pretty expensive. The second challenge is that ultimately we want to do this with multiple qubits, not just one. And there is a natural notion of multi-qubit noise spectroscopy and what happens is that now there's actually not just one noise spectral density, but there are several that reflect the different ways that an environment can couple to multiple qubits. And so in principle, if you really want to fully characterize the noise, you need 
to measure all of these different noise spectra. Um, and so, so this is a big challenge. Um, and, so we, and so we tried to, to take off a small piece of this, which is to understand what kinds of things can we learn about the noise spectral density using measurements that are fast and scalable. Um, and, so the, and so something has to give here. You know, the, this is sort of intractable the way I've set it up. And so there are two ways that you can, you can try to make some progress on this. One of them is that you can settle for learning only partial information about the noise spectral density. For instance, maybe there's really only one question you have about it, like what's the total noise strength? So you don't really need to know S of omega at every frequency to answer that question. You just want to know the integral of S of omega. So that's an example of how you could make this task easier. Another way you could make this task easier is to try to, use, to try to have some prior knowledge about the noise. Like in the case of quantum dots, you might know something about the qualitative features of the noise spectrum. Like you might know that perhaps it has some sharp peaks at certain frequencies, but you don't know what those frequencies are. And in, in, that, ki in that kind of situation, you can also do noise spectroscopy more efficiently. And, and so, this, and so this, this is what we were actually able to do. So, you know, so what we, what we developed is a technique for noise spectroscopy using random pulse sequences. And the way we construct these random pulse sequences is kind of special, and, you know, and we'll get into that later. But we could show that for a single qubit, we can learn certain things about the noise spectrum very quickly. So one of them is that we can learn arbitrary linear functionals of S of omega. And this is using techniques from uh, signal processing called phase retrieval. Um, and we'll get into what phase retrieval is a bit, more, a bit more later. But it's an imaging technique that has been used in other fields. And we borrow some of their techniques. And so here we're showing that given any function t of omega, we show how you can generate a random pulse sequence that will measure the integral of s of omega times t of omega. And so this sort of, what well, you can think of t of omega is, is it's a function of frequency that reflects your interest in different frequencies. <clears throat> and you can dial that in, and then we show how to generate a pulse sequence that will measure just that quantity. So that could be something like the total noise. It could be some function that reflects um, your, the dependence of, of the overall fidelity on different noise frequencies, and we can give you a pulse sequence that will measure just that quantity. And then the second thing we do is to show how to do complete characterization of S of omega when S of omega consists of sort of sparse peaks using compressed sensing. And this is built on top of the first result. This is, this is, somehow, um, this is somehow combining this first technique with compressed sensing and we show an application of this to quantum dots. And, you know, so the place, that, the place that we want to go with this ultimately is to scale this up to multiple qubits and, and eventually be able to do this on large complex systems. But, you know, but the place where we started was to try to, try to, how to understand how to do this better on a single qubit. So that, that's where we're going with this. So, you know, so, so in the rest of this talk, we'll, um, We'll tell you about, about this in a little more detail. So first, let me just give a, a brief description of how noise spectroscopy is conventionally done, and then I'll hand it over to Kaisin, who will tell you about our random pulse sequence method. You know, so, so, you know, so just to review, the, the model we're considering is a, a single qubit coupled to a classical bath. And so the, 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 um, the total Hamiltonian is a sum of sigma z terms. The first one is, this, is the qubit Hamiltonian itself. The second one reflects coupling to a classical field V of t. V of t is this, assumed to be a Gaussian process, so we're using some Gaussian approximation here with mean zero and with some covariance, which is given by this function g of t minus t prime. And now the noise spectral density is the Fourier transform of this function g of t. And we're assuming some cutoff frequency, omega c, that that tells you the highest frequency that you expect to see in the system. And if you want to, you can generalize this to, to quantum environments. Much of this goes through for this, the quantum spin boson model. But you know, just, just for the time being, let's just use a classical environment. And so, you know, so 
um, the most conventional way of using, of using noise spectroscopy is to, is to do a certain pulse sequence, and then you do a measurement that estimates the inner product between the noise, spec the noise spectral density, S of omega, and some window function, W of omega. And you try to make it work out so that this window function is peaked at a particular frequency, omega naught. Okay. That's, that's typically what you do. And so, the, and so it's a simple pulse sequence. It starts with a Hadamard gate, then a sequence of pi pulses, then another Hadamard gate, and you do a measurement. And what you observe is that the longer you run this, this pulse sequence, um, the lower the contrast is on this measurement. So when you start out, the probability of, of getting zero is one, but then it gradually decays towards one half, and this decay exponent gives you this measurement of the noise spectral density that I mentioned. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly, but um, when you take the limit of many pulses, this window function can be approximated by a delta function, and this means that this decay exponent tells you the value of the noise spectral density at a particular frequency. And so here's a picture of what this looks like. So the window function is at the bottom, and here we're gradually, in, we're gradually increasing the frequencies of the pulses, and so the window function is sort of creeping over towards higher frequencies. Okay, so this is, so this is the, the conventional way of doing noise spectroscopy, and we're going to try, we're going to, try, to try to mix this up a little. So what we're, we're doing to mix this up is, um, so we want to make this window function look different. And to do that, we need more degrees of freedom. So we're going to do something that involves choosing a finite impulse response filter of length lambda, which has these coefficients. And now we're going to, do, we're going to need to do some computation with, the, with this filter. And I'm going to impose strong restrictions on what we can do with this, because I want this to be sort of experimentally feasible. So I'm going to insist that we're going to do some computation that can be done in real time without storing the pulse sequence in memory. And so I want to imagine that this will run on something like an FPGA or a real-time controller that's located close to the qubits, somehow at the bottom of the control stack. You know, so like you, have, you imagine that here's your experiment, it's being run by some real-time electronics, and then somewhere up above there's a laptop controlling it. But I want this random pulse sequence to actually be generated on the controller. And so I want it to be streamed from the controller to the qubits, and this should be done in real time, and you should not need to remember the pulse sequence afterwards. You shouldn't need to have something like an arbitrary waveform generator in this setup, okay? So, yeah, so, th so that's the setup for, for what we're going to try to do. So now, let me hand it over to Kai Sin, who will, yeah. who will tell you about the details. All right, thanks, Kai, for this amazing introduction. And so for now, I will walk you through the technical and maybe a little boring part about our new toolbox. So this is how we're going to generate this, those random pulses. So first, we are going to generate a sequence of independent Gaussian random variables. And then we will couple them to the so-called uh, finite impulse response filter coefficients. So as you can see in this big bracket, we basically get another Gaussian random variable. And then we take the sign of them to produce another random variable, and we name it u of j. And apparently, this, the mean value of this u of j is zero, and it only takes values in one and minus one. And based on this u of j, we can generate our random pulses. The way we are doing that is at time j times tau, we apply a pi pulse if u j not equals to u j plus one. Yeah, I know this is like abstract, but in a more intuitive way, this is our total time uh, like in experiments. And we can cut it into pieces uh, where each time segment is tau. And then we have some random pulse generator. You can think about it like a black box. And we have our filter coefficients. And you input that filter coefficients into your random pulse generator. And what it produces you is another random variable u, where each element labels one particular segment on this timeline. And the mean value of this random variable is zero. And every time one two neighboring uh, random variables alter its sign, you apply a pi pulse right at that point. So the next question is, what is its window function? So remember, in the normal CPMG method, 
the window function is like a delta function. And here, you know, since everything is at random, so maybe we need to ask what is the average value for the window function. And the answer turns out to be quite interesting. So this is the expectation value of your window function, and that contains two parts. The first part contains like a sync function because we have like a, a pause sequence, sequence structure, so you will have this sync, uh, sync function. That's trivial. And for the next part, well, it kind of looks like an, a Fourier expansion to the order lambda, but with coefficients rk times a small correction term, which I did not show uh, specifically here. And this r of k is actually defined as the covariance between different pause sequence segments. And it can be also be defined as a function of those filter coefficients, uh, but in a quadratic form. So now let's take a look at this window function. This form in light of that we might be able to do an inverse engineering problem. So given a target function t of omega, uh, so is it possible to generate a certain random pulse sequence with an average window function such that we can match them up? And by saying match them up, I, well, frankly speaking, they cannot be exactly the same because your target function can be negative. Well, your window function is always positive. However, you can always do some uh, simple transformations to your target function, like adding a constant number. So for simplicity, in this talk, we will just assume that your average window function can be exactly the same as your target function. And to solve this problem, we need to design a certain filter coefficients to make this happen. And in a more detailed way, given our target function t of omega, you can solve what is the pulse covariance r of k by simply matching up those Fourier uh, coefficients. And then given r of k, we can easily get what is the auto correlation terms. But the next pro uh, step, it's not trivial. So given those auto correlation terms, can we solve what is A of J? And to solve this problem, we need to apply a well-known technique called phase retrieval. So this is what phase retrieval, uh, retrieval does. So we have these auto correlation terms, and we want to find out what's the best op optimal A J. And to solve this problem, we need to define a new periodic function B of X and we can transform the previous question to an equivalent problem. So given the value of bx squared, what can we solve for b of x given all the constraints on a of j because you know it's a physical system and it has many constraints. And this is a very famous problem called phase retrieval and it, it has numerous applications in like image reconstruction for lens uh, intensity measurement and many other things. And in our paper, we made a very beautiful proof that uh, we would always find a solution towards this problem to match your window function to the target function. And we designed a certain algorithm to help us find the optimal value. And yeah, I know this is kind of messy. We have a lot of like definitions. We have a lot of random variables. But here's a take home message. You can forget all those above things, but only remember this thing. So all we want to do is to directly estimate the following linear functional. And the way we are doing that is to set up a noise spectroscopy experiment. Uh, the basic structure is the same as CPMG. You have Hardman gate, you have pulse sequence. Uh, but the different thing is that our input is some target function. It can be any function you want. And you input that to your random pulse generator. And this random pulse, inside this random pulse generator, it runs some algorithms, not algorithms like phase retrieval, blah, blah, blah. But eventually, what it produces you is a sequence of random pulses. And then you can use it to do your experiment and measure what is like the decay rate. And you need to uh, repeat those experiments. So you need, you need to generate a lot of random pulse sequences. And we call that one set of sequences. And after that, when you average them all, you will find out that the average window function of those random pulses will just approximate t of omega, and that gives you what you want. And again, here's a simple animation that shows you what's going on. So in the first animation, uh, it's uh, random pulses. And so as you can see, every frame describes an individual random pulse because it's random, so it's like, so it's like keep fluctuating. And 
the, in the third picture, this blue curve describes the average window function. So as you can see, as we increase the number of random power sequences, their average value will gradually converge to this red curve, which is our target function. So that's the overall picture of this project. <clears throat> and I guess another question is like, how rigorous is this random power sequence method? And to answer it, we need to find out what's the variance of the decay rate, because apparently this decay rate will fluctuate because everything is at random. And it turns out that we, we can upper bound those fluctuations in a very nice way. And let me explain what's happening here. So we have three components. Uh, we have the L1 norm on S of omega, which can be interpreted as like the total noise strength. And we have the L2, uh, L infinite norm on S of omega, which can be interpreted as like the maximum noise strength at any single frequencies. And in the leading terms, we have this lambda tilde. Well, this kind of complicated. This term is an index that tells you the complexity of the correlations between uh, the random power sequences. The, the underlying idea is that we can view those random variables as a Markov random field. And, but right now, you don't need to know where it comes from. You can just view it as an index. So the most important thing is that we have this capital M here. So remember, the capital M is a total number of segments in your like, you know, total time, like here. Sorry. Yeah, here's a capital M. That's the definition. So the import, most important thing is that your variance grows linearly with capital M. And that's quite amazing because the expectation value of your decay rate also grows linear, linearly with capital M. So that means if this M is large enough, your variance is relatively small compared to the, its expectation value. In other words, uh, the decay rate is quite concentrated for, despite different uh, you know, random pulses. And at last, uh, we can try to see some interesting applications of this method. And in this talk, we will focus on the compression thing. OK, so now we have this new toolbox for which we can measure arbitrary linear functionals of S omega. And then you may wonder, so what? Uh, what? What are those interesting applications? So what are those interesting target functions? So here are three uh, possible directions that we thought of. The first one is the most trivial one. So what if your target function is a constant? So in a way that we are measuring the total noise strength. And this could be a very useful term in like, uh, it can be used to bounce in some for torrent uh, quantum error correction frames. And so in our protocol, it's super easy to realize. We just set the co uh, those coefficients to be zero. And we can keep like a, do a real time monitoring of those noise strengths. And what if your target function is some simple polynomials? In that way, we can measure the low order moments of the noise spectrum. And this could be interesting because according to some theories like the 1D chain mapping models, uh, if you have a spin bosom model, you can map that to a one dimensional chain where your spin is coupled to a bosom and another bosom and another bosom. And according to that theory, if you can measure the first few cumulant of your noise spectrum, you can do an accurate simulation of the short time dynamics of the whole system. And in this talk, we want to emphasize on the third uh, application. So what if your target function is on uh, sinusoidal functions? And by doing that, we are able to fully reconstruct your spectrum if your spectrum is sparse. And let, yeah, and let me explain what does it means. So your noise spectrum is called sparse if we uh, approximate as a discrete, uh, so the noise spectrum is a continuous function, but we can approximate as a discrete subset on n grid points. And if it contains at most S non-zero elements, then we can call this one uh, S bar spectrum. So for example, in this picture, the blue curve describes uh, our ideal spectrum, which is two sparse. And according to the compressing theory, uh, we can use some random sinusoidal functions to probe this spectrum. And theoretically, we only need S log N sets of sequences to fully reconstruct the spectrum. So, 
in this example, m equals to 12, but the capital N is very large, it's 250. And ideally, this is an exponential speed up compared to the normal CPMG method. Also, we can uh, draw a diagram of the accuracy in the reconstruction against M. And as you can see, the accuracy will e experience a phase transition. And the critical point for M increases linearly with sparsity. So different colors represent different sparsity. And this MC just represents a critical point for this phase transition to happen. And you may be wondering, OK, so is there any realistic systems that has a sparse spectrum? And the answer is surprisingly yes. So this is our simulations on the indium arsenide and gallium arsenide quantum dot systems. And the, those blue curves are their theoretical background, which is indeed sparse. They have some peaks with some, with some widths. And this red, dot, uh, red dotted lines is what we reconstructed from random pulses combined with compressed sensing. And we successfully locate where those peaks are and find out what's their relative strength. And on the right picture, we can compare our method with the normal CPMG method. So here, this N set is kind of like the M in previous slides. And this uh, quantifies how many, the total time resource you need to finish your experiment. So the blue and red dotted lines is what we get from compressed sensing, but with different parameters. And again, they experience a very sharp phase transition. And compared to the green dotted lines, which this, uh, represents the CPMG, you can see a very decent improvement in like time results and also in accuracies. And we further uh, test our protocols on some commercial platforms. For example, we test it on IBM superconducting qubits and on INQ's trapped ion qubits. So these are the parameters of those platforms. And because you know there's no intrinsic sparse noise in those two platforms, so we kind of cheated. We use a tool called Swarm to manually inject some sparse noise. So as you can see, those blue curves describe our injected noises. And then we can reconstruct the spectrum using you know, CPMG, which is labeled in green, and random path sequence with complex sensing, which is labeled in red. So what's interest, uh, one thing worth noticing is that uh, in IBM, on IBM, we have we see some white noise background because you know it has a relatively higher spam error and readout error, and but the compress sensing method somehow ignores this error, so it's kind of robust to errors, and we can further compare the performance of random power sequences on different platforms, and again we can draw the phase transition diagram. So surprisingly, despite different properties of those uh, platforms their behavior is roughly the same. So that means uh, our protocol combined with compressed sensing is robust to noise in a certain degree. So here's the summary. Uh, we build up a new toolbox, we call it random power sequences, and we can use that to measure arbitrary linear functionals of S omega. And it can be used to do a lot of interesting things like fast reconstruction of sparse noise spectrum and other things. So our future research uh, evolves in like generalizing our pulse with duration other than pi, and we can generalize to multi-qubit systems. And since our protocol is very easy to realize in experiments, so we are hoping to see some exper experimental realizations on different platforms. And all of these things all contribute to a grand uh, challenge. So can we do robust quantum simulations on these hardware? Yeah, thanks for your attention. Awesome, yeah, thank you so much, both of you. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah, Alicia. I have one question. I was thinking about top noise and averages. Like, I'm doing CPMG, and I want to know the amount of noise at each frequency. I have to do a bunch of runs mm -hmm. to average down the shot. This random pulse sequence, do I need to do that many runs at each point, or is it sufficient to average all the Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So the thing is that because the, the variance, uh, so, so this slide tells you that the, uh, the, the fluctuations seem to carry it is very small. So eventually, when we want to do the experiments, let me try to play from current slide, okay. 
So actually, yeah, what you say is right. So actually, we need to repeat the experiment on one single uh, random power sequence. And, and then let's call it N2. And then we need to apply different uh, random power sequences. Let's call it N1. And the thing is that since uh, the fluctuations in the decay rate is very small, this N2 can be quite small. So it's like you can just run like 10 or 20 experiment on one single uh, random power sequence and make a rough estimation about what's the decay rate. And then you can do many experiments on different random power sequences. And the overall time result, which is N1 times N2, is roughly the same as CPMG for one single uh, frequency. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's an, another very good question. So I guess the answer, if you want to find out what's the region that our method works very well, uh, currently we don't have like a very specific answer. So that's one thing we want to explore. And according to our experiments, it works very well in, yeah, it works very well in a certain region, but the boundary is something we need to find out later, yeah. Right, okay, one last question. Oh, yeah. So actually, that's another thing we don't have time to talk about. So another application of this method is that it can be applied to spin boson models, uh, where you have a quantum noise, of course. And surprisingly, we can also apply our method to this thing. And we, we it, because um, in the case where, even though it's a quantum bath, as long as we have like a Gaussian noise, things like that, we can still use our method to probe it, yeah. Okay, let's thank uh, Kaizen and Mikai again.